Okay, honor students, we are going through Concept 1 notes, which are on Mendelian genetics, so kind of an intro into heredity. So I want to make sure you remember, with the exception of gametes, which are egg and sperm, all cells in your body are diploid, and they contain two copies of each chromosome, a copy that came from mom in her egg and a copy that came from dad in his sperm. So if you remember correctly, 46 chromosomes make you who you are. 23 that came in the egg and 23 that came in the sperm and remember they fertilized in as a zygote and that's when you first had your 46. So remember genes are sections of DNA that provide instructions for making proteins and proteins are what are expressed as your traits and things like that. So since a gene is a piece of a chromosome and we have two of every chromosome you have two copies of instructions to make every protein in your body. So two copies work together in order to determine what protein is going to be made and expressed. So alleles are different versions of the same gene. So let's say we have a gene for hair color or eye color. We'll do eye color to match this one. The gene is eye color. And so you have a chromosome that has a gene for eye color from mom and a chromosome that has a gene for eye color from dad. But those genes may say different things. Dads may say brown eyes and moms may say blue eyes. The brown gene versus the blue gene are the alleles. They're different versions of the same gene. So you inherit a full set of chromosomes containing genes from each of your parents, but we may not have inherited the same version of every gene. So the two alleles, the two versions of the gene that you inherit work together to determine what's going to be expressed. Remember, homologous chromosomes are the matching chromosomes for a mom and dad. They have the same genes in the same locations, but they may have different alleles on them. All right, so Gregor Mendel, he was an Austrian monk, and he studied pea plants to learn what we basically know today as like the foundation of genetics and uh, in inheritance. So he's known as the father of genetics, and he came up with three laws of inheritance. The law of dominance, law of segregation, and law of independent assortment. So we're going to go through each of these, but first I want to talk about his experiments so you can kind of understand the legitimacy of them and how he figured out what he figured out. So he studied and bred pea plants, and three things were true about his experiments. First is that he was able to control the breeding. He used plants that self-pollinate so that he could make sure there wasn't any um, non-random mating going on. He, really, he wanted it to be very... Um, very controlled. Two, he used only purebred plants, meaning plants that whose ancestors are genetically uniform. So when he used a purple plant, it was completely purple. Everything about it, every organism it had come from had been purple as well. And then he also only looked at either or traits. So traits where there were only two options, such as round versus wrinkled peas or tall versus dwarf, or purple flowers versus white flowers. So you can know just looking at yourself that most of your traits are more complex than that. There's not just two options. But there are some in humans that are either or traits, and we'll talk more about them. Um, but he only looked at either or, so he was only looking at two options, and here's what he found. He did crosses, which is mating two organisms. P stands for parental generation, so this was the first generation. F1 is the first generation of offspring, and then F2 would be if I crossed some F1 um, offspring and made more offspring from them. So, in the first generation, the parental generation, he crossed purebred purple with purebred white, and he got all purple. Then he crossed two of these F1 purple flowers, and he got 75% or three quarters purple, and one quarter or 25% white. And he didn't just do this one time. He did it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And he consistently used to formulate his laws. So first being the law of dominance. A dominant or strong allele will express itself over a recessive or weak allele. So dominant is the allele that if you're always going to have that trait shown if you have it. So whether you inherit two of these alleles from both parents or only one from one of your parents, you're going to show that dominant trait. So for instance... If big B represents the allele for brown hair, and brown hair in general is dominant to blonde hair. Hair color is more complex, but in general, it's dominant. If you inherited this big B allele from one or both of your parents, you would have brown hair. 
So whether you get two of them or you get one and the other one's from the other parent, you're going to have brown hair because this will dominate this one. Recessive is allele you'll only have expressed when the dominant allele is not present. So if brown hair is dominant over blonde, letter little b would represent the recessive allele for blonde hair. And the only way to get blonde hair would be to get that little b recessive allele from both parents so that it can't be masked. So you'd have to be little b, little b. That's what dominant and recessive mean. So these letters are genotypes. These are the actual alleles you inherit. Do you get two dominant? Both your parents give you dominant alleles. Does one give you dominant and one gives you recessive? Or do they both give you recessive? That's what a genotype shows. The phenotype is going to show the physical trait of the organism. So purple flowers or white flowers or in humans in the hair, brown hair, blonde hair. That's what's physically going to be expressed based on the genotype. So we have assigned alleles to letters. Uppercase letters represent dominant, lowercase letters represent recessive, and the actual letter in the alphabet, like A, B, C, D, whatever, doesn't really matter. We tend to just choose letters that maybe are related to the trait, but again, it doesn't really matter. It's the upper and lower case that actually matters. Remember, each individual has two alleles, one from each parent for each trait. So homozygous would be if you got the same alleles. Either both parents give you dominant or both parents give you recessive. Your chromosomes would look like this. Whereas heterozygous is when you inherited different alleles from your parents. One parent gave you dominant and one gave you recessive. So your chromosomes look like this. So we can refer to genotypes as being homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous. That's the law of dominance. Now onto the law of segregation. It says when chromosomes separate in meiosis, each gamete, egg and sperm, will receive only one chromosome from each pair. So if you look, this set original parent cell has two sets of homologous chromosome pairs, a blue set and an orange set. Let's say those are two different traits. Okay, but notice at the end, they only end up with one blue and one orange copy from what they started with. So each only gets one from each pair. So, if a man has alleles for brown hair and blonde hair, meaning he's heterozygous, he's big B, little b, his sperm cells will only contain either a big B, let's say these two can contain the big Bs, or the little Bs, these two contain the little Bs. Each sperm only gets one of the alleles because the second allele is going to come from whoever he's mating with. All right, and then last is the law of independent assortment. It says that the assortment of chromosomes from one trait doesn't affect the assortment of chromosomes from another trait. So during metaphase, they line up randomly. It's not like all the dominant get on one side and all the recessive alleles get on another. It's completely random. So any combination of maternal and paternal chromosomes can be passed on because homologous chromosomes line up randomly during metaphase. And this is why you can have the same parents as one of your siblings, but still look and be so different from them. Now, Punnett square is a great tool that we're going to use the rest of this unit. It's a diagram that shows the probability of inheriting traits from parents with certain genes. So on the outside, you put the genotype of the parents. It doesn't matter which parent, mom or dad, goes on which side. And then on the inside, you fill in based on the corresponding boxes. So this would be crossing two parents that are heterozygous. And what we get on the inside is the possible genotypes of their offspring. Possibly, 25% would be homozygous dominant, 50% would be heterozygous, and 25% would be homozygous recessive. We would say the genotypic ratio is 1 to 2 to 1. Now the phenotypic ratio, what would be physically seen, well three of them are going to show the dominant trait, which if this was flowers, we could say the purple trait, whereas one out of the four is only going to show the white trait or the recessive trait. So three to one would be the phenotypic ratio. We're going to be using these all the time. So there's some practice problems. I want you to try them in pencil. And I'm specifically not giving you the answers here because I want you to come into tutoring and get help with this to make sure you really understand it. But you're going to try these three practice problems. And then when you're ready, once you've gotten tutoring on monohybrid crosses, which are just looking at one trait at a time, I want you to look at dihybrid crosses, which are looking at two traits. So what is the possible genotypes for offspring when we're looking at two genes at a time? So what's the likelihood that you inherit 
long eyelashes and blue eyes or short eyelashes and brown eyes, those two together. So there's some steps you take to determine this. You'll write the genotypes of the parents. You'll sort the alleles to figure out what are the different combinations of the two genes that could be passed on. We're going to use FOIL. So think from algebra, first, outer, inner, last, to make sure we figure out all of the different combinations. Then you'll write these different combinations on the side of the Punnett square, and you'll combine the letters from the top and side to fill in the boxes like you did on a monohybrid cross. And then you'll determine the phenotypic ratio. I'll never have you do a genotypic on one of these. So, like before, there are, notice how much bigger the Punnett square has to be. Uh, here's some practice problems, but again, I want you to come into tutoring and get help on this to make sure you're doing it correctly. So there's our second example, and there's a third. So you have three examples for monohybrid and three for dihybrid. And the last thing for you honors I want to show you is using the rules of probability to figure out genotypic ratios. So I can use probability to determine the possibility of getting a specific genotype. And this is especially helpful if I wanted to look at more than one gene at a time, and especially more than two. Because if there's two genes, you can do the dihybrids, but any more than two, it's just getting way too out of control. So what you do is first, you would perform a monohybrid cross for each individual gene. Depends on how many there would be, but if, let's say that we're looking at three genes. You'd have to do three monohybrid Punnett squares, and then you'll determine the odds of getting each genotype. So do this in fraction form. Then you'll multiply the odds to determine odds of getting this and this and this and this and etc. depending on how many genes there are. We're multiplying because in probability, if we want to know what's the probability of this and this, we have to multiply. If we wanted to know this or this, we would add, but we want to know and, so we're going to multiply. So an example, let's say Erica has the genotype big A, big A, big A, little b, and little c, little c for three different genes, gene A, gene B, gene C. Carlos has a genotype, he's heterozygous, heterozygous, heterozygous for the same three genes. We want to know what's the probability of Erica and Carlos having a child who is heterozygous for all three genes. So he looks like dad, or she looks like dad, with the same genotype. So we're going to do a Punnett square for each gene. So we would do a Punnett square for A and figure out the probability for gene A. So if we cross Erica's genotype for A and Carlos's for A, we get that half of their kids would be homozygous dominant and half would be heterozygous. Then we do it for B, which they're both heterozygous. We get a fourth homozygous dominant, a half or hetero, and a fourth are homozygous recessive. And then we do it for C, where she's homozygous recessive and he's hetero. And we get half hetero, half homozygous recessive. Then, we to figure out what's the probability that they're hetero, hetero, and hetero, we have to multiply half by half by half. And 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 2 is 4, times another 2 is 8. So there's 1 out of 8 chances that they end up with a child that is heterozygous for all three genes. And that is um, Mendelian Genetics for Honor Students.